time on Landmarks, we journey to the river of life. Check in to a hotel with a difference. Witness the revival of Dracula, almost. And marvel at the thrill of discovery of a lost civilization. But first, downtown New York is home to one of the city's most recognizable icons, the Rockefeller Center. Its interior and exterior is a trove of Art Deco treasures and a living reminder of an architectural era that was both brave and bold. Construction on The Rock, named after John D. Rockefeller Jr., began in May 1930. Its nearby cousins, the Empire State and Chrysler buildings, were all under construction at the same time. Covering 22 acres between Manhattan's 48th and 51st streets, the centre is home to such media giants as NBC, Time Life, News Corporation and Fox News. But many viewers have heard of the legendary Studio 8H, home of Saturday Night Live and the Radio City Music Hall. The observation deck, known as the Top of the Rock, recently opened for the first time in 20 years. It's only 7 metres wide and 65 metres long, but it takes in most of the city's landmarks, including the rival Empire State Building. Sky shuttle elevators with glass ceilings and a light and projection show take visitors up to the 67th floor in just under one minute. The views from here are 360 degree panoramas of New York City. You see the best of New York. The only place in town you can see the Empire State Building. The only place you can see the Central Park and all of its uh, uh, leaves and foliage. You see the Bronx, Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Bridge, the Statue of Liberty. Uh, you see everything from here that you can't see from anywhere else in New York City. John D. Rockefeller Jr. opened the narrow deck in 1933. The observation deck's original Art Deco design was inspired by the decks of the great ocean liners of the era, complete with deck chairs, gooseneck features and vents inspired by a ship's stacks. On a clear day, visibility is about 130 kilometres and it's a stunning, unobstructed view. But to take in this experience, you must book through the internet. It's a great sight at any time of day. The atmosphere constantly changes and is often dramatic. Sunsets can be particularly beautiful. Back on the ground, Rockefeller Plaza is part of New Yorkers' everyday life. In late November, there's the annual lighting of the Christmas tree. In 2007, the 26-metre-tall Norway spruce was sporting energy-saving bulbs and an array of solar panels atop 45 Rockefeller Plaza to power them. This was the 75th formal tree lighting ceremony, with the first official lighting held in 1933. But the first Rockefeller Christmas tree was put up two years earlier by workers helping to build the complex. The 60-year-old spruce has been covered with five miles of wire and 30,000 multicoloured bulbs known as LEDs. They've taken 30,000 energy-saving light bulbs for this tree, these LEDs. It uses one-third of the power that we used in past years for, to light this tree. And then up on the building roof, they put 363 solar panels in the biggest solar panel in New York City uh, to light this. It feeds into the grid and powers this tree when it's lit. For many, it's the start of the festive season. I've done it more times than anybody. What keeps you coming back? Because I love New York and at Christmas, it's the best place in the world to spend Christmas. Whether you're a celebrity or a local, it's a great sight. Uh -huh. The tree is beautiful. Yeah. It's not cold, so nice. but we're enjoying the cold. Yeah. The tree's topper can sparkle even without lights. The Swarovski star is adorned with 25,000 crystals. But New Yorkers believe the Rockefeller Center has a special sparkle all of its own. I think you can see it from space, it's so bright. I've been coming here every Christmas season with my parents since I was a little girl. And, you know, tonight being the first night that it's lit, I just think it's so magical. Coming up, the Nile River. The mere mention of the Nile River 
evokes images of ancient wonders, the pharaohs, the pyramids, the sphinx, the Bible, and fantastic tales of wondrous treasures. But the longest river in the world also represents life to the people of Egypt and to the many that live along its 6,000 kilometre bank. From the earliest times, the waters of the Nile, swollen by monsoon rains in Ethiopia, flood over the surrounding valley every year and fertilise the crops. Now with water conservation an issue and massive sub-Saharan poverty a reality, those who live downstream from Egypt in Uganda, Tanzania, Sudan and Kenya want a fairer distribution of its riches. A 1929 treaty signed between Britain and Egypt proclaimed no country can undertake any project that would reduce the volume of water reaching Egypt from its key source at Tanzania's Lake Victoria. Only cooperation can unlock the development potential of our great river, provide win-win benefits to us all, increasing access to food, energy and water supply, and enhancing trade and international relations. Tanzania is building a pipeline to extract drinking water from the Nile, and Ethiopia is planning to use the water for irrigation. But the water minister's meeting in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi, played down reports that they will negotiate a replacement to the treaty. We are saying we are all committed, so if we are all committed to whatever we agree to, then we should be uh, moving towards the possibility, the, uh, the equitable utilization of the water, the river. But we have to, uh, to, uh, to realize that uh, the Nile Basin has tremendous uh, potentialities which, we, which none of us has already tapped or, uh, or utilized so far. There is great hope and opportunities for all the people of the basin and we should work toward that rather than creating uh, you know, issues and problems. For decades, Egypt's dominance over water distribution has been a long-term issue for the upstream countries. However, the fact a meeting was held was an optimistic sign. Tanzania's position on that one is very clear. We have stated it for a long time. In 1962, just after independence, our father of the nation, Julius Nyerere, came public and said we do not recognize those treaties because we were not party to them. And this has continued to be the position of our government all this time. But I thought this, this is no longer an issue because we are sitting here looking at a shared vision of programs within the Nile Basin which will help 300 million people. Egypt had no objection to a plan by Tanzania to use Lake Victoria to supply water to parched northwestern communities. However, despite its promises of aid to basin countries, Egypt has warned it will need even more Nile water after 2017 because of population growth. In the meantime, fishermen, as they have done for millennia, continue to fish along the river and its source, Lake Victoria. Three rivers flow into the Nile from the south, the Blue Nile, the White Nile and the Abara. The river fills all areas of Egyptian life with symbolism. The ancient Egyptians believed the sun god Ra was ferried across the sky daily in a boat. In the Bible, there are countless references to the river as a source of life. Expedition crews also enjoy the Nile, encountering uncharted rapids, hippos, crocodiles and even elephants, hoping to make history through a journey that stretches through Uganda, Sudan and finally Egypt. Even in modern times, the Nile continues to nurture and remind us of who we are and where we came from. Well, here's a landmark of a different kind. It may not rank with the pyramids or Mount Everest, but from an animal's point of view, it may be more popular and relaxing. Yes, there is at last an animal hotel, and it's in Berlin, Germany. Man's best friend is a popular guest, and like many on holiday, may crave his privacy. Others are more relaxed. You may be pleased to know this hotel is not restricted to just dogs. The reception, shop, cafe and swimming pool are open to all. But as in any hotel, luxury comes at a price. The price of a room in summer starts at 23 euros. The prices range up to 51 euros depending on the size of the dog, the length of its hair and the time of year. 
it's cheaper to have a feathered friend. Parrots can stay the night for only 7.5 euros and cats for 15 euros. It's like a real club holiday. The animals are kept busy the whole day. At 7 o'clock, they go into their playgroup for the first time. Then they have breakfast and each animal gets what they like to eat. Then there's a small break and they go back into their playgroups or the swimming pool. It's like that the whole day. The whole day we throw balls and sticks and frisbees. Who books their pets into a luxury hotel? Owners of dogs, cats, rabbits and other furry friends who cannot bear the thought of leaving them at home or with friends or in a kennel. For the guest, it's a dog's life, especially if you love having a ball, fetching one or even eating one. There's hours playing by the pool, or in the pool. And guess what? You don't even have to compete for the ball. There's enough for everyone. are allowed, but admittedly, they tend to avoid the swimming pool. But it is very popular with dogs, and there are even fitted life jackets for those who don't feel so safe in the water. It's absolutely doggy heaven. The owners of the resort say it is the largest of its kind, and with almost 89 hectares of land, the animal kingdom is almost as big as Monaco. Once the pampered pooches have received their doggy massage, they can retire to their exclusive suite, some of which have a private balcony. Parrots tend to have their own bird's eye view. The result is an animal that is returned happy and refreshed to its owner. It's hard to know who is happier, the owner or the dog. Naturally, we miss the dog in the two days we were away, but now that we have seen her, I think she has been really well looked after. The resort is beautiful with a swimming pool, tennis court and lovely grounds, and I think the trainers do a good job. In addition to a menu tailored to your animal's individual preferences, there is also a beauty parlour and a psychotherapist to allow your furry friend to get rid of the everyday pressures. Even the most stressed can't help but relax. Coming up, Dracula Park. This is a landmark story about a theme park which, just like its principal character Dracula, never really lived, but during its short tumultuous existence still managed to induce fear, anger and outrage. In 2003, the Romanian government announced it intended to build a Disneyland-style Dracula park in Snarkov, north of Bucharest. But from the start there was powerful opposition. The park's initial location near the medieval town of Sigasoara prompted heated reactions from UNESCO and conservationists said the park would spoil the area's historic ambience. So it was moved. A lot of people in all of the world, the analysts, the specialists, the president of tour operators, the journalists, said that the project is original, non-conventional, even the shocking project. Horror rides, catacombs and a vampiric institute were included in the 300-hectare theme park. 
Writer Bram Stoker based his 1897 novel Dracula on the real-life story of Vlad the Impaler. Most Romanians know the real Prince Vlad Tepes as the 15th century hero who fought off Ottoman invaders and defended Christendom until his death at 49 in 1477. But to the locals, the theme park was no blood-sucking affair. As far as I heard, some 600 new jobs would be created. That's something beneficial for our area. It is a good thing that the Dracula Park will be done. There will be new jobs for people. Romanians have only come to know of Dracula recently. While the Dracula story was spreading worldwide through books and movies, few locals had heard of the vampire count before 1990, when Bram Stoker's gothic novel was first translated into Romanian. Communist dictator Nicolae Ceausescu, toppled in a bloody revolt in 1989, had previously banned the Count. The mayor of Snargoff, Theodor Birus, said he would welcome this project. The history says that Romanian ruler Vlad Tepes was here. He is buried here in the nearby monastery. From an economic perspective, the park location is feasible because it is very close to the capital. Bran Castle in the Carpathians is a tourist attraction in its own right because of its typical Hollywood horror backdrop looks. Locals here say Dracula belongs to their area, but there is no historical evidence Vlad ever even visited Bran. But he did build a princely court in central Bucharest. The idea of a theme park did not receive universal support. Bucharest's elite have built their holiday villas around Snargoff, whose local population of 7,000 rises to 50,000 in the summer. I don't think it's a good idea because um, maybe there is the um, airplane, maybe there is um, more people, but uh, here is a place who. Um, who uh, people know that the Dracula was here. The whole of Romania is a Dracula park, and our tourists visit all the regions following a story and seeing a country. But if you set the Dracula park in one location, no matter which location, then you stop this flow of tourism uh, throughout the country. But in the end, it was the Orthodox Romanian Church that helped stop this version of Dracula returning from the grave. In April 2006, the Romanian government announced the contract with Dracula Incorporated had been cancelled. This time, it wasn't a wooden stake that stopped Dracula, but a planning permit. The combination of church and local opposition to the development was too much. And when it was clear that locals were expected to provide 80% of the predicted 1 million annual visitors, the economic arguments also undermined the project. But like all good vampire movies, don't expect Dracula to take this lying down. And I think that is the time to put Dracula to work for Romania. In this era of sophisticated technology and intense archaeological research, it's hard to believe that the Earth can still hide lost civilizations. But it does, and the thrill of discovery was recently given to a team of hard-working US and Peruvian explorers deep in Peru's Amazon jungle. Following up on years of investigation about a possible lost metropolis in the region, it took a month of hard trekking in Peru's northern rainforest to reach the location. A city which may have been home to up to 10,000 people was uncovered. It was an ancient walled city complex inhabited some 1,300 years ago by a culture later conquered by the Incas. Covered in matted tree branches and interspersed with lakes and waterfalls, the settlement sites also contain well-preserved graveyards with mummies with teeth in almost perfect condition. It is an amazing discovery the stone city is made up of five citadels at 2,800 metres above sea level. It stretches over around 100 square kilometres and contains walls covered in carvings and figure paintings. The 2004 El Dorado expedition to Gran Saposoa has been an amplification of the work of the past three or four years. 
And what we've been able to do is finally to verify the extent, or what we believe is now the beginnings of the understanding of the extent of Gran Saposoa, which we know now is the oldest Chachapoyas settlement or complex. Savoy and his team had to hack through trees and thick foliage to finally reach the site. Replete with stone agricultural terraces and water canals, the city complex is thought to have been home to the little-known Chachapoya culture. Now, in 2004, we have visited new sites in Gran Saposoa that indicate uh, a century even older. So now we're talking between 7th and 8th century after Christ. And we have also amplified this understanding through the discovery or recovery from the jungle of five new citadels that now need to be further studied. According to early accounts by Spanish conquistadors who arrived in Peru in the early 1500s, the Chachapoyas were a fair-skinned warrior tribe famous for their tall stature. Today they are known for the giant burial coffins sculpted into human figures found in the northern jungle region. Savoy said his team also found an Inca settlement within the city complex that could prove theories that Chachapoyas were conquered by the Incas. The Chachapoyas, contrary to the Incas, built their grave sites on the high cliffs of their cities. And you have these high, very hard to reach cliff sides where you find these tombs with sarcophagi of their ancestors. How they reached them, how they built these tombs on the cliff sides is a mystery until today. Savoy, a Peruvian American, accompanied on the expedition by his father, Jean Savoy, has already mapped the area with preliminary drawings. The discovery is the third notable ruin Jean Savoy has helped uncover in Peru. In 1964, Savoy found the site of the Inca's last refuge in the Cusco region of southern Peru. A discovery that will now become part of Peru's history and of the world forever. American Hiram Bingham made Peru's most famous archaeological discovery, the fabled Inca ruins of Machu Picchu near Cusco in 1911. Machu Picchu today attracts almost half a million tourists every year and is South America's best known archaeological site.